Ethereum's monetary policy. All right, this is a different curve. Looks a little bit different than Bitcoin, although like not smooth. Too much smoothish. Uh, like if you look at sort of the the line mm -hmm. over the last, um, you know, Ethereum's almost ten years old, so it's nine years or so. So, what is Ethereum's monetary policy? What has it been? What um, like changes? What events have occurred? Give it. Give us the timeline here in the rundown. I would actually say Ethereum kind of lacked a monetary policy and perhaps even like continues to lack a monetary policy to this day, uh, which is one of the biggest wedges, I would say, defined the difference between the Bitcoin and the Ethereum community. Um, Bitcoin, Ethereum started its monetary policy when the blockchain started, uh, which was initial block rewards will be five Ether per block with no future prescriptive nature about any changes in the future or like any sort of model or anything. It's just like, hey, we're going to build this Ethereum thing. And we're going to issue five ETH a block uh, during its proof of work phase. And that was as much like kind of thought that went into the whole system. Uh, and so Ethereum Genesis block, July 30th, 2015, five ETH per block. Uh, October 16th in 2017, so a little over two years later, it was decided that Ether, uh, Ethereum was sufficiently secure and that we should reduce the issuance of Ether. So we went from five ETH to three ETH without really knowing what security is or any sort of like end game target, we just said, hey, like uh, Ethereum, ETH price went up a lot. Uh, we are now issuing a lot of Ether in dollar terms. I think we can afford to like reduce the supply of Ether into the market. So we did in 2017. Um, February 28th was the next one, 2019. Uh, the block reward went from three to two. Uh, so continuing a reduction of the issuance of Ether, again, without any sort of like rigorous nature. And then in December 1st, 2020, uh, we created the Beacon Chain. Uh, so the Beacon Chain was a separate blockchain running in parallel to Ethereum, which would eventually become merged with Ethereum. And this was when this weird phenomenon happened in which we had both the two Ether per, per proof of work block on the proof of work side of things being issued, and then also a marginal increase of Ether being issued because we were also securing the Beacon Chain in proof of stake. I think So I think it was something like, of a three to six percent increase in total ETH issuance because we had these two chains running in parallel. August 5th, 2021, we introduced EIP 1559 and we started the burn, which is one of the first like uh, opinionated, directional, uh, prescriptive natures about like what should the ETH monetary policy be. Uh, we decided that excess um, fees ought to be burned. So excess demand of the Ethereum economy, we burn those things. Um, and that started this whole meme around ultrasound money. In 2015, uh, September 15th, 2022, we merged. So we deleted the two Ether per block reward on the proof of work chain. Uh, and we only had the beacon chain issuance, which was much smaller. Uh, and so this created, fulfilled this like idea of ultrasound money. Um, and it was a very constrained issuance algorithm with the burn. And this is actually the moment where ETH uh, went deflationary. So at the moment of the merge, there was more Ether in circulation than there is today. The supply of Ether, it goes up and down because we do issue Ether on the consensus layer, uh, but we burn Ether on the execution layer. Uh, this is like, of course, transaction fees. On net, since the merge, uh, the supply of Ether has gone down. I think we have burned something like two, two or three million Ether. Um, and... That is where things uh, are today. We uh, uh, activated withdrawals, but that actually didn't change the issuance curve of Ether. We activated withdrawals in April of 2023, and that is as things stand. This is the changes that went into effect. One ad I'd make there, David, and, and uh, maybe it's a qu quibble, sort of a semantics thing. Um, you said that uh, Ethereum has not had a monetary policy from the very beginning, and I would sort of agree with that, but also disagree. So, so like... When you say it hasn't had a monetary policy, it's always had a monetary policy, but the monetary policy has been soft, let's say. It's been squishy. It hasn't been well-defined. It's not been like um, the Bitcoin monetary policy, which is what's our, we're going to have uh, the supply every four years and we're going to end up at 21 million. With, with Ethereum, it was basically like, we don't know where this thing's going to end. And it was like that in 2015. We're going to add a more precise, calculated, algorithmic monetary policy later, but we don't know how much we're, we should actually be paying for uh, issuance, right? So that is a cost in the network. And of course, in these crypto economic systems, these, these uh, layer one blockchains that we're building, what does the issuance pays for? 
pays for the army. It pays for the economic defense of the entire system. Um, I will say, though, since the early days, and this sort of uh, came to be verbalized in the Ethereum community, kind of like the social uh, layer of things that we often on Bankless call kind of like the layer zero that sits be be beneath all of the chains. At the layer zero, around, I would say, 2017, 2018, the community started talking about the social contract of the Ethereum monetary policy, which is, um, as defined, minimum necessary issuance or minimum viable issuance, which basically means we're only going to issue blocks to pay for economic security. So it can't be siphoned away for any other use case because that is the most credibly neutral uh, way to sort of spend our block issuance money. And how much are we going to spend? The minimum necessary to what? Mm -hmm. Secure the network and keep it decentralized, right? And so if you go back to Satoshi's original 21 million, I'm not sure a lot of thought was given to that number. It's like, <laughs> like, what do you think? I mean, he's probably just like, let's just do this every four years. You know, the Olympics happens every four years, whatever. Every four years, we'll just cut in half, we'll end up at 21 million, boom, put it in place, and it hasn't been touched since. That's the difference. Ethereum's has been changed, right? But I'm, I'm not sure it went through um, like any, like, I'm not sure that Bitcoin's issuance curve had any greater foresight into let's let me sit and calculate how much economic security Bitcoin needs in the fullness of time. And I come up with this, sure. mis, um, you know, like 21 million number. That is the answer to all of the problems. Uh, you know, Ethereum's just been a bit more gradual. It's been looser and has begun the hardening process, I would say. So the changes more recently have become less drastic, more algorithmic. But it certainly wasn't, it was loose on day one, it is now less so. But it's not completely hardened either. Right. Well, so the Bitcoin monetary policy, I, I agree, just didn't really have much uh, thought put into it. Kind of by design, like it was said, hey, a, a hard cap, 21 million, whatever, 100 million, whatever. So long as we approach a hard cap, then that's kind of the Bitcoin's monetary policy. And it was like simple by design. Like a hard cap is just a pretty simple thing. The only thing left, once you've decided that a hard cap is good, the only thing left to decide is how quickly or slowly that you get there and what kind of curve uh, it takes to get there. Um, what Bitcoin received as a result of that is predictability. Mm. And this is the thing that Bitcoiners love about the Bitcoin monetary algorithm is that like you can just model it out independently and say like, oh, uh, at this particular date on this year, Bitcoin supply will be exactly this and you will be like within like 98% of a correct answer. The only reason why there's a difference is because the hash rate on Bitcoin changes. With Ethereum, you've never had any sort of predictability. Uh, and so you don't really know what the supply of ETH will be at a given moment in future. And so this is kind of the problem with ETH's minimum viable issuance policy. I don't call it like a systemic problem, but like it's, it's a vibe, not an algorithm. And actually no one really knows what minimum viable is. Uh, because you don't know what minimum, if you are approached a mini minimum until after your blockchain like gets economically attacked, which is not desirable. So you actually want to have a buffer above a minimum viable to stay away from it because you don't know where it is. Um, and this is one of the big concerns about the Ethereum system is like we have a direction, we have a vibe, but we are um, still left to be opinionated as to where that vibe is or how close to that vibe we want to go or the choices we want to make to get there. Well, there's two criticisms uh, that come, I think, from the the Bitcoin uh, community when you contrast that with Ethereum monetary policy. One is, you know, predictability, like you say, you can't sort of calculate mm -hmm. into the future. I think that's actually less of the concern for many uh, strong fundamental Bitcoiners. I think that is part of the concern. I think the major concern is you can't touch the dials because that's a, there's a slippery slope there. Once you start to change things at all, right? So then you introduce some humans that are able to change things. And that destroys the entire, I guess, uh, illusion that um, like of scarcity of your money, essentially. And I, I think among very strong Bitcoiners, they would say 21 million is Bitcoin. It can never be changed. If it is ever changed, of course, this is code. So you can hard fork Bitcoin. You could change it to 25 million instead of 21 million. You could you implement a 5% issuance. But the true deciders of what Bitcoin is, is actually the layer zero, is actually the social right. community. Who is actually running the Bitcoin software, right? Um, like the, between the miners and uh, those that can verify and validate the transactions that the miners put out. 
who who does the community actually what does the community actually say is the true code for Bitcoin? And I think for Bitcoiners, some of them don't even acknowledge that the social layer exists. I've had m- right. many arguments with them in the in the past. It's hey, like it's all you know social layer. It's all layer zero at at the end stage. There's an Ethereum layer zero with minimum viable issuance, the, and there's a Bitcoin twenty one million. But you're still dependent on those nodes right. to kind of run the software. But they, the, the joke that I like to make about this yeah. is that the Bitcoin social contract is that there is no social contract. Yeah, exactly. Right. We don't talk about <laughs> which it's is, a fight which club is still rules. a social contract. We just don't talk about it. Right. Um, <laughs> But they're very uncomfortable, let's say, with the tweaks that um, human beings like core developers are able to make and uh, you know, like the decision that the community has to make to just what do we do in the future with respect to issuance? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think that that kind of defines the differences between Ethereum and Bitcoin. I think Ethereum, the Ethereum uh, vibe about the monetary policy is like Bitcoin directionalism without being uh, Bitcoin precision. Uh, and so, like, we appreciate the idea of, like, hey, don't touch the controls, don't be, don't be erratic, uh, be constrained. Uh, but we also, as Ethe- the Ethereum culture say, like, but we need to be pragmatic and we need to make sure that when we, like, tie our hands to the mast, that we know that we've developed a system that is anti- anti-fragile and resilient. Yeah. And that's actually kind of getting to some of the um, uh, proposals from this ETH monetary update, is we are, th- we are considering the fact that we are not ready as an ETH monetary policy system to tie our hands to the mass and let the system Don't go. ossify it too soon has been you know, exactly. part of the social contract. But l- let me just say some things that would be clearly outside of the social contract, right, of Ethereum, it's like mm-hmm. good luck getting this through, right, is right. let's say you increase issuance by like 1% and you delegate that to core devs, uh, yeah. for, for instance. That would be a change that would not go through because that is not encompassing with the minimum necessary issuance. And what would be the check on power to that is the community would rebel. People would not accept that hard fork. It would like not go through the same way that that the 21 million mandate is upheld uh, with Bitcoin. So right. there are some things that are very clearly outside of minimum viable, minimum necessary issuance. Uh, like mm-hmm. like that, for example. Um, and there's some things that are... You, you, if you wanted to get that change in, you would first have to change the social contract of Ethereum, which is a very hard thing to do. I think so. Or else what do you end up with, right? This is hard fork governance, choice lose. You'd, you'd have, you know, Ethereum with um, like a, like a uh, ETH grant and then actual Ethereum, right? It's like it'd be a Ethereum classic versus, you know, uh, Ethereum original all over again. So you get kind of a hard fork. So where does that bring, just refresh us now. So you went through this, this timeline of Ethereum monetary policy and issuance. So mm-hmm. where are we now? Like there are some people I think that thought we were at the end of this, right? We did, right. We did the, the burn, we did the merge. Okay, we, we do have some sort of issuance um, like chart that like you know, shows what issuance will be in the future. There's some sort of uh, you know, algorithm involved here. W- where are we now? Aren't we done? Why aren't we done? I actually kind of want to go back to this one part of the changing evolution of the ETH monetary policy to a part that I'm wondering if listeners caught this as we kind of just, I kind of just glossed over it, which is um, when we created the proof of stake beacon chain. Uh, And then all of a sudden I said like, hey, proof of work rewards are happening. That's two ether per block on the proof of work chain. And then also proof of stake rewards. But like, what's the supply schedule of the proof of stake chain? Because that's actually now the supply schedule of what we now call Ethereum. Uh, and so a lot of people kind of like glossed over how this uh, current curve of ETH monetary policy was selected. That's where the new uh, issuance there, is happening, you're saying? Yes, that's where the new issuance is happening, yes. And so there is this post inside of an ETH research forum uh, called uh, the Beacon Chain Consensus Spec. And it was about, uh, the, the post is signal non-final status of base reward and desired issuance goal. Uh, and so this is uh, the Ethereum researchers coming to some sort of equation about the proof of stake chain, which is the current Ethereum chain, and what the issuance should be. This is back in 2019 so, is the original date of this post, by the way. Yeah. So there's this equation that is the current monetary issuance schedule of Ethereum, which is the yield equals 2.6 times 64 over the square root of staked ETH. And that's the curve. Hmm. That is the equation. Uh, And this produces a logarithmic curve, so it starts very high on the y-axis at the very beginning, and then it tapers off very quickly, and then it slowly approaches zero at the end. Uh, And (laughs) the comments on this ETH research 
post, this forum on GitHub, uh, is pretty pretty interesting. Um, Justin Drake uh, does says, below is my rationalization as to why these numbers are reasonable. And then he like targeting two to the 25 ETH at stake, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then assuming each shard consumes an average of 1,000 ETH in gas per year, blah, 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 with half the gas burn, blah, blah, blah. And inflation would be about half a percent and the validator return would be 5%. Feels healthy, exclamation <laughs> point. Yeah. Which is like the level of rigor that went into this thing. Is like True. Justin like did some napkin math, and I, I've seen Justin do napkin math before. He's generally directionally correct. Um, it's, pro- it's, probably, just like- <laughs> it's probably the same napkin math, though, that Satoshi did. It was like, probably, yeah. Let's have it every four years, end up yeah. at 21. Feels healthy, feels like it could but work. But like Bitcoin gets that luxury because as long as they approach a hard cap, like mission accomplished, right? right? Like Ethereum doesn't have that same luxury because that's just not what our vibe is. It's just I, the emphasis I want to place on this is like Justin Drake did these like three sentences of napkin math and then says feels healthy at the very end. Um, John Adler, if you scroll down, he quotes feels healthy and goes, that doesn't seem like a particularly rigorous metric. Neither does that this other blockchain <laughs> has X issuance rate and they haven't gone attacked yet. So X must be fine. Uh, why not outsource the task to an independent panel of actual economists. And so this is actually a question I have for you, Ryan. When we merged to proof of stake and enabled withdrawals, did you think that we were done with ETH monetary policy? Like, what did you think about ETH monetary policy at the time? Were we like hands off? We were ready to go. This is going to be it. Or like, we're going to have to change. What what did you think about like the conclusion of ETH monetary policy once we went um, proof of stake and merged? I mean, I think it started off in like you know, 2015, 2016, it was more like, it was just like a liquid. It was just kind of like, um, you know, water sloshing about or something like that. And then slowly it's hardened over time. And so like maybe, you know, 2018, it became like a jello type form, but I didn't feel like it was fully like concrete. There was still some, um, hardening left to do. And so I felt like maybe there could be like one more, like maybe two, Mm -hmm. but the changes would have to be, um, like much more slight, uh, you know, not really affecting very much. I mean, it could be other burn mechanisms uh, that we introduce, for instance, sure. uh, you know, like, but it would have to be in the spirit of minimum necessary, minimum viable issuance, and like wouldn't be a major change that would affect everything. So just, a, a, yeah, it, not fully ossified, but real close, getting real close. Yeah, I remember thinking um, when, even before we merged, there, that there was never any sort of conversation about um, the ETH issuance curve out in public. It never really reached, um, I never heard about it really. And so like when we did the whole merge thing, I was like, you know, where did, where did we decide, where was the where conversation about ETH monetary policy? Where did those numbers come from? And like my intuition was because I didn't hear about it as like an, a more an external Ethereum community member, I, I kind of just assumed exactly what ultimately happened, which is just like, we licked our fingers, stick it up in the air, felt the wind, and be like, that's the vibe. Just, Let's go that It's way. just not that different than what Satoshi probably did. It's just right. b- because you don't see how the sausage is made with Satoshi, mm-hmm. and it's shrouded in this mystery of a pseudonymous founder who just like kind of like set the, yeah. the ship in the direction and just kind of like left. Then like that feels like it has much more narrative, I guess, legitimacy in terms of setting mm-hmm. the, the policy. Then looking like you can actually see it in this link in GitHub and you kind of like see how it uh, came to be. Right. You, you see the inside uh, baseball, you see mm-hmm. how the sausage is made. Yeah. And so like always in the back of my head, I've always been like, there's, there's going to be one more because we did a bunch of unrigorous policy changes, directional, you know, self-correcting policy changes. But like in order to actually like tie our hands to the mass on one of Ethereum's most important pillars, which is, it's monetary policy, it's security, like we need rigor and debate. And because we kind of just like glossed over that conversation when we picked that curve in proof of stake, I always, in my mind, was like, there's going to be one more. Like we're not done yeah, yet. Yeah, it felt like the network's not done yet, right? Like not all of the mm-hmm. economic agents have entered. Like in particular, like layer twos, we we, we were, were just on the cusp of these massive chains starting to consume Ethereum block space or just staking is new and liquid staking is new. And now Eigenlayer like has so entered the picture. so much data left to connect, we uh, collect. We don't even have an Ethereum ETF in, in the US, right? So the institutions haven't even entered. So how's, how are these economic players going to end? W- one, one other thing I'll just, just mention is a massive disadvantage in having a hard cap and saying like 21 million is you actually, we've 
we pointed this out in the kind of like the earlier days of bankless is you actually don't know if that economic security is going to be enough to provide the level of like settlement that your layer one actually needs, right? So Bitcoin uh, you know, block rewards drop down to zero and will transaction fees be enough to pay for uncertain. a decentralized global settlement layer? Like uncertain, but it feels like, um, wow, that's, that's a pretty big they, risk. They've already tied their hands to the mask though. So they're going to find out. Right. They're going to find out. Whereas um, Ethereum can be a bit more, uh, they can sort of wait the decisions over time and let all of the economic agents kind of enter before they fully ossify. So that brings us to the conversation that we are having we are right now. finally here. F 50 minutes into this episode, we are finally arriving at modern times. So what is this? What is the debate? Right. What is the actual proposal? Why do we even need, why is anyone even proposing that we need to change issuance uh, in any way? So Ansgar and Casper from the Ethereum Foundation, these are researchers from the Ethereum Foundation, released this uh, ETH research blog post called End game staking economics: a case for targeting, uh, and so importantly, end game. Uh, rather than like we, it's, the Ethereum culture has, I don't know if you noticed this, but like started to replace this word ossification with end game. Uh, and so like we're actually kind of removing ossification from our vernacular and kind of replacing it with end game more and more and more. Uh, and so like we're this is the attempt to discover the end game issuance curve for Ether Ether's monetary policy. And importantly, this thing is uh, they're calling for a case for targeting. Uh, and so um, what's targeting? Targeting is basically trying to find a particular percent of Ether supply that is staked to Ethereum and targeting that number by putting bounds on the left and the right side of that target. Okay. Uh, and can, can I just understand that? So like sure. that, that is what they're trying to target is percent of ETH staked. They are not yes. trying to target issuance. They're not trying to, right. there's uh, just over 120 million ether mm -hmm. in circulation. And that number can go up, it can go down based on like rewards versus burn. They don't really care about that number. That's not the metric that they are targeting. What they care about is percent of ETH staked. And right now it's around like what? between 25 and 30%, something like that? Yeah, it's like t just over 25%, but it has been increasing up only ever since inception. Okay, and so Ansgar and Casper, if I understand the contours of this proposal, they think it's mm -hmm. a bad thing for Ethereum to go too high in terms of percent of ETH staked. So a bad scenario would be like 90, 95% mm -hmm. ETH staked, like anything that is directionally close to that is bad. And around, you know, like 25 to 30%, 35, 40, like that feels like a safer zone. And so that's mm -hmm. what they're, that's the, when you say targeting, that's the thing that they're targeting. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And they also make an argument that like, if we get uh, higher than 50% ETH staked, I'm not sure. I don't think this is in the blog post, so I might be putting words in their mouth. But the vibe is that like, once you approach some like, uh, uh, pass some equilibrium, like once you pass 50% of ETH staked, the difference between 50% and 100% of ETH staked is not the equivalent of between 0 and 50%. Like once you hit 50%, like there's kind of a magnet at the 100% end and you very quickly approach 100% and it's very hard to reverse that uh, for all the incentives of uh, ETH staking. So that's the reason uh, that they're bringing this up before we cross these thresholds where it becomes right. harder and harder to kind of go back. C can we just like, why? Why does it matter what percent of ETH staked? Like, why is 90% a mm -hmm. bad thing, according to Casper and Ansgar? What reasons do they give? There's a number of different reasons. Um, maybe I'll kind of start by uh, defining the differences between solo staking and uh, staking service providers, what we would call LSTs. Um, LSTs, like Lido, Rocket Pool, you know, StakeWise, and now even LRTs, uh, liquid restaking tokens, do a very similar thing, if not more. They reduce the cost to stake. Um, do you hold any like RE or like stake teeth, yes. uh, Ryan? Yes. How uh, costly in terms of your time, energy, and capital was it to trade your ether for that stake teeth? Incredibly simple. Easier for like than technically running a, a solo staker, right. of course. There's just some associated risk. But there's also for me, right. it's like there's risk in running a solo staker as well. But very, very nice. easy from a like uh, just click a button. And also, if you were to solo stake your Ether, you would not get staked ETH or RETH in return. It's not liquid, uh, you mean? So, 
It's not liquid, exactly. And so the incentive to use a, a liquid staked token is high because you get liquidity on your staked ETH. The cost of staking with a liquid staked token is very low. Uh, it's like 10% of your yield for Lido. But then you also don't have to run your own node. Uh, these professional operators are doing it for you. Uh, and so you actually like unburden yourself and you just pay you know, a 10% fee to the Lido system. Uh, and so the costs of solo staking are like high because you can't restake and you have to run your own node. Uh, you get some fees back, but really uh, this is all compression of fees anyways. Like all these liquid staking providers are all competing on fees. Uh, and so by making it so incredibly easy to stake with a service provider, uh, we are basically assuming that the supply of staked ETH is going to approach 100% because the curve of ETH, the ETH monetary policy is logarithmic. It approaches, um, it, it marginally decreases in yields for the higher percent of ETH stake, but there's no real mechanism to prevent it from going to 100. And this was, this is true for like all of the uh, LSTs. Now we have LRTs doing token incentives like, like three-fourths, I think, of all new newly deposited uh, Ether into the beacon chain is going into Eigenlayer. And so this is an external force on uh, yield on Ether that's coming from outside of the protocol. So even that is pushing Ether into being liquid-staked Ether into being liquid-restaked Ether. Okay. So the, the argument is that uh, solo staking is fundamentally losing to staking service providers simply because of the dynamics of the supply curve. Okay, and why is that bad? Was it bad to, so ba basically the, one of the arguments here is this would result, like if we don't change something, we'll have fewer uh, solo stakers and that is a bad thing for the network. Is, is this the argument and yeah. why? Not just fewer solo stakers. Uh, that's, that's one thing and I think that's important, but also let's go back to what we were talking about with the Federal Reserve. We actually have a removal of M0 money from the Ethereum ecosystem mm. and we almost, in, in a 100% LST staked world, we actually only have M1 money. And this is actually starting to get into one of the, my motivations for this episode because I actually think Bankless has a position here. Hmm. Uh, M1 money is intermediated money. Right. It is banked, banked <laughs> money. It's banked money. Right. And so Lido... Or it's like, more banked Rocket, on the spectrum. It's more banked. Yes. It's more banked. Even, even Rocket Pool, which is like uh, non-custodial and permissionless, is still intermediated by smart contracts, which have smart contract risk. And so we, uh, this current Ether monetary schedule, this curve, actually does not protect vanilla Ether. So it's actually one thing to talk about the protection of solo stakers, which I think is totally noble and we should definitely consider that. I also think even more, much more critically, this is a conversation protecting raw vanilla Ether and the M0 of Ethereum. Base money, basically. Base money yeah. of Ethereum. And so the idea of constraining the supply of ETH staked is in protection of base money. It's, in, uh, it's a boon to the value of raw Ether at the cost of staked Ether in terms of value. So let me see if I can kind of connect those dots of why it's bad to have um, like all of the Ether inside of M1 rather than M0. Mm -hmm. So we're basically saying if you move from Ether to um, like Lido staked ETH, it, you're moving from M0 to M1 without realizing it. The same way if you put cash in an ATM, uh, inside an ATM and it goes in a bank account, well, you've just converted your M0 uh, into, into M1. You have sort of you know, a set of bankers that you're kind of dealing with. Now, there are levels of like what we mean by bankers, right? With Rocket Pool, it's much, much more decentralized. You're trusting some smart contracts, that sort of thing. There's actually no banker in the Rocket Pool system. There's just smart contracts. Right. So with, with Lido. The smart contracts are the bank, which we are generally cool with. With Lido, you have uh, some smart contract risk and then a permission set of validators. We made that'll decentralize right. over time. And then also yeah. you have kind of like a Lido governance token, which is, again, mm -hmm. that's um, another layer of something, some sort of intermediary. Some, some intermediary. It could be light intermediary, maybe it's acceptable, but it's not as pristine as M0. Right. And then if you go to the extreme case where you have an exchange doing this, the staking like a Kraken or Coinbase or something, well, that is purely, you know, CETH on Coinbase, uh, for example, That that is purely banker inter intermediated Ether. And imagine if that was 90%. Mm -hmm of all ETH supply was staked inside of CETH. Well, if uh, uh, you know, like an exchange founder goes wrong, you get another Sam Bankman fried on the, uh, uh, on the scene, they decide to fractionalize that Ether reserve 
uh, then they can kind of do that. And there can be all sorts of shenanigans. And we're left with the same system that we um, that we left, where you have banker intermediated money. Uh, I, I guess it's sort of a, t- a tail wag the dog type of uh, scenario um, as well, where it's just like the protocol loses power to the banker cabal. To continue leveling up your crypto game, then you need to get on the Bankless newsletter. It's the world's most popular crypto email and is completely free. Just click below to sign up.